my fellow humans, <laughs> I'd like to suggest to you that in this polarized world of ours, where we have one crisis after another, the kind of revolution and activism that we need is sacred activism and a human self-knowledge revolution. This means deeply understanding the complexity of who we are as individuals and as humanity and taking action from that integrated human self identity. Now, I'm a human rights advocate and activist. I'm also the daughter of activists. My parents were part of the solidarity movement in Poland in the 80s. Solidarity was a trade union movement that led to the rise of a social movement that led to the dismantling of communism in Eastern Europe. But at one point we left Poland and we were refugees in Italy for over a year. We lived in refugee camps, uncertain but hopeful about the future until we were resettled to Canada. And I was a little girl at the time. So that experience, those struggles, in a way they, they programmed me. And when it was time to choose a career, I chose international law and off I went around the world, north, south, east, west, as a human rights advocate and humanitarian. I worked for many years in post-conflict and conflict areas. And I often say that during that time I saw the best and the worst of humanity. And as I was working with the different communities and connecting with the, the persons and the refugees and learning about their stories and their struggles and ideas and cultures, that humanitarianism and cosmopolitanism became my identity. Cosmopolitan comes from the ancient Greek word meaning citizen of the cosmos or the universe, what we now say global citizen. So my circle, my tribe, my family had expanded. I went from being a national to a refugee to a citizen uh, of a multicultural country to a migrant and a global citizen, but always a human being. And on this journey, I had a guide, uh, a guidebook, you could say, and that's our evolving universal moral code that we call human rights. It's not me. That's Eleanor Roosevelt, and she's holding the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The declaration came in the wake of terrible atrocities of the Second World War, when there was a sh shock in the conscience of humankind. And human rights are a collection of wisdom over generations about justice that come from different sources, including from spiritual traditions. And one of the opening key principles is about the inherent dignity, inherent human dignity, our human dignity that we are all born with. Now, human dignity means that it is a sac sacred value. Human dignity means inclusion of others into our moral circle. It means love of humanity. And yet, indignity and undignified treatment of people continues. War continues. And so my connection to the suffering of others around the world started to really pile up in me and, and become part of my own suffering. I was affected by all these conflicts. I was affected by the conflict in the Holy Land. It broke my heart. And so I went deep inside. I decided to do inner work and disconnected from the outside world and went deeply into meditation. I thought if I can find peace in the world, maybe I'll find peace inside. And it worked, but it also threw me into a crisis. And it was a psychological and spiritual crisis. And that crisis hinged on the question of what am I and what does it mean to be human? And it set me on a path of deep exploration. It was an awakening and a transformation. Now our personal crises are connected to our collective crises. 
and our transformations to our, and our awakenings. And now we have a window to the world like never before. We can see every human misery and triumph at the touch of our fingertips. And this means an expanded empathy, meaning I feel your pain. But it also means an increase in polarization. And if you've spent any time on social media, you know what I'm talking about. People are polarized because we're asking questions that divide us about who we are. So we see others in a negative light and ourselves in a positive light. And the opposition is vilified because they threaten something sacred. And this polarization, it creates self-righteousness and indignation and emotions and energy that create action and activism and revolutions. So it's good, but it pulls us apart. And it continues like a cycle. So how do we come out of this polarization? Well, I'm proposing this human self-knowledge. So what are we as humans? The word human has an origin from the Latin humus. Kind of sounds like hummus. Uh, humus means of the earth. Human beings are of the earth. But we've also developed different meaning-making systems and mechanisms along the way. So how do you think of yourself as human? You might think of your biology, or your psychology, your mind, your culture. Maybe your race, religion, nationality, your politics between left and right, your past, present, and future. Maybe you think of yourself as part of nature, or as a spiritual being, or a material being, or consciousness. Human beings have developed these meaning-making systems to navigate reality. We put ourselves in different categories, part of teams that give us worth, our dignity. We go with people like us. And people not like us? Well, that limited self-knowledge has justified incredible cruelty over time. And even dehumanization, treating others as less than human. And so these uncertainties, when our reality gets uh, threatened, it creates crises. And now we have all kinds of crises, right? The climate crisis, the crisis concerning refugees and migrants. That's about identity. It's about what kind of we are we. Are we a fearful we? Are we an inclusive we? Are we a limited we? Are we a compassionate we? It's complicated. And the simplest answer that we've come up in history is this eternal fight between what we call good and evil. So religion is a source of our human self-knowledge. It gives us a story, a roadmap of where we've been and where we're supposed to go. From that deep, dark void through the tribulations of life to our better, more enlightened selves. It's very compelling, especially in a time of crisis. But our human self-knowledge expands, it's vast, and it intersects, it evolves. Since the 1950s, we've had what's called the cognitive revolution. And this is an interdisciplinary study about the human mind that we call cognitive science. So it includes disciplines like anthropology and linguistics, neuroscience, artificial intelligence, psychology. Psychology is another source of human self-knowledge. Psychology means the origin of the word is the study of, of the breath, soul, and spirit. I'm quite fond of social psychology that has this theory called self-categorization that says that we think of ourselves at levels of abstraction. So I'm an individual, 
at one level, and then I'm connected to groups. And at the highest level of abstraction, we have the human in relation to non-humans. And other schools of psychology say similar things. So for example, integral psychology, or integral theory, talks about how we can expand our consciousness to transcend and include from the egocentric self, the ethnocentric, world-centric, and cosmocentric self. And this field of psychology gives us the tools to do that, one of those tools being meditation. Other schools say similar, th similar things. So transpersonal psychology, transpersonal means experiences outside of the self to include humankind and the psyche in life and the cosmos. So remember this, fear separates, love integrates. Human rights have come out of revolutions. And that's why we have, because they come out of struggle, we have in the opening line about all members of the human family having an inherent dignity, all members of the human family that will strive towards peace in the spirit of brotherhood and sisterhood. It's a reminder, these words are a reminder about our human family, to love the human family like you love your own family. It's about the sacredness of every human being. Now, love of the human family, not easy. Maybe even love of your immediate family is not easy. Remembering the sacredness of every human being, even the one that you vehemently disagree with because you think you are right, not easy. Because we know that human beings can be cruel and divisive and selfish and unkind. But our expanded human self-knowledge gives us more information. And so that person that you might revile can also be caring and, and cooperative and kind. Shakespeare wrote in The Merchant of Venice, if you prick us, do we not bleed? If you tickle us, do we not laugh? So I told you a little bit about my story, but we're really, we're retelling the human story. So let's come back to sacred activism. The term sacred activism came from the author and scholar, Andrew Harvey. And sacred means valuable, but it also means holy. And holy, the root of the word, means whole. Sacred activism means taking the wholeness of our human self-knowledge and applying it to social and political action. It, it means taking that inner exploration and knowledge about ourselves and applying it to knowledge about the world. Sacred activism means compassion. It means expanding the circle. It means activism with compassion so that we're not perpetuating the polarities and the problems that we're trying to solve. Sacred activism means activism from the heart. It may be a bleeding heart, but we know that everyone has a heart that pumps blood and oxygen and nutrients to the body and the brain, and it can be broken. That every human being feels and suffers and struggles and desires love. So let's heal each other's broken hearts. Thank you very much.